Welcome to my talk. It's going to be about yarn and how to make yarn easier. Who knows what yarn is? Who was here an hour ago? Yeah, I know it. Okay, so yarn is uh, part of the current release of Hadoop, and uh, Hadoop is the elephant. Uh, it can handle tons of data. It's, it does all the heavy lifting for you when you have to do uh, massive data processing. A distributed application in Hadoop classically looks like this. You recognize this, right? This is a MapReduce job. Um, you have a bunch of mappers. Each mapper reads a split from the file system, spits out some tuples. There's a shuffle phase in between that does sorting. And then there's a bunch of reducers, and each of them spits out data, writes them to file system into part files. Um, this is a very powerful pattern. We can do lots of different types of data analysis, um, but we cannot do everything. However, Hadoop gives us an infrastructure that allows to run many different kinds of MapReduce jobs in a single cluster. So here I have uh, four different MapReduce jobs running. Hadoop has a scheduler that allows me to place my uh, computations close to the data. Uh, lots of useful features. But if I look closely here in this picture, I see that uh, a lot of the nodes in my cluster are actually not used. Because not all the time do I have enough data to analyze. Sometimes I have peak um, amounts of data, and I need all the nodes in my cluster. Sometimes I don't. So what could I do with these, these gray little boxes here that are right now just sitting in the data center consuming power? And the uh, question is, well, maybe I have a data scientist in my, uh, in my lab, and, and he says, I, I'd like to write a message passing application. That's also a distributed application. I have here, I have six processors. They all talk to each other. They all interact with data somehow locally. And uh, they need to run in a cluster. I might have a stream processing app, right? I get events. They come in in real time. I have processors. They uh, consume these events in real time. They may write some data to a database. They may read some data. Um, but again, it's a distributed application. It can run in a cluster. And uh, maybe I could run that in my Hadoop cluster. And if I have no important applications to run, maybe I could do some testing. Because, for example, if I have some web service, I want to do some load testing. I could just run a test on uh, many nodes in my cluster when I have spare capacity. So I actually know lots of ways to use the spare capacity in my cluster. Um, and if I could do that, then my cluster looks more like this. There are still some gray nodes, but um, it looks much more diverse, and I can do all these different things in a single infrastructure. So uh, this would be ideal, right? I'd love to do that. Um, now, let me quickly explain why I would love to do that. Um, my name is Andreas Neumann. I work for Continuity. And um, what we have built is a product that's a developer-centric big data application platform. And um, it pretty much runs any type of processing that you have to do in a Hadoop cluster. It runs real-time stream processing. It runs batch anal analytics like MapReduce. It runs, uh, we run tests there. We run web services there. And um, when we built this platform, we were kind of desperate. Say it's about two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, and we couldn't find an easy way to run all these different things in a single cluster. And the answer that we found was Yarn. So uh, that was about the time that Hadoop version 2 came out. And um, that had um, one major advantage over Hadoop version 1. In Hadoop version 1, there was a job tracker. And the job tracker was responsible for managing the resources of the cluster and for driving the execution of MapReduce jobs. So the programming paradigm and the resource management were very tightly coupled. And that was the reason why it was very hard to run anything other than MapReduce in a Hadoop cluster. With Hadoop 2.0 was the new resource manager, Yarn, and that separates these two tasks. There's resource management, and there's the programming. And it allows to run pretty much anything in your Hadoop cluster. 
And uh, how this works now is, so here I have an application that I could not run in Hadoop previously. And um, in Yarn, I will now have a resource manager that runs on the side. And the only thing that I have to do is I have to write an application master. This is one new process that I have to run. It negotiates resources with the resource manager. It acquires containers to run tasks in. And then it drives the execution of the application in those containers. So now the logic of how the application is executed is in the application master. And that's my own code if I want to. So I have all the power. And with Yarn, my cluster now looks like this. I have the resource manager on the side. And all of my applications have their own little application master. OK. So far, all clear? Good. So um, let's look a little bit closer how Yarn works. So in Yarn, I have my cluster. Every node of the cluster runs a node manager. And I have the Yarn resource manager, which sits there as the central um, point of control. And here I have a Yarn client. The Yarn client wants to start an application in the cluster. So the first thing that happens is the Yarn client needs to submit the application master to the resource manager, which means it needs to bundle up a jar and some configuration and tell the resource manager, I want to start an application and here's the master. What the resource manager does next is it finds a free container in the cluster and it talks to the node manager of the node where that container is located and it tells that node manager to start the application master. So now the application master is alive. It's running and it can now start talking to the resource manager and ask it for more containers. So now it could acquire, say, three containers and once it has these containers, it then talks to the node managers in the cluster to start its own tasks in those containers that it received from the resource manager. So this is the interaction. And these steps, number three and number four, they can repeat. So the application master can dynamically ask for more resources, can give up resources. And resources, in this sense, um, are always containers in the cluster with a given capacity in terms of memory or virtual cores. Now, this looks fairly simple. Um, so I want to dive a little bit deeper. So let's just look at this first step, submitting the application master. Um, what does that mean? So we have, a, we have a Java, a jar file with some Java code. That's the application master. And we want to run that in one of the nodes of the cluster. Now the client has this jar file on its local file system. If we just tell the resource manager, find the container and, and run this jar, and this container is going to run somewhere here and the jar is not going to be on its local file system. It's not, it's not going to work. It cannot access my local file system. That might be my laptop, right? So um, what needs to happen is, first thing, the client needs to copy this jar file to the distributed file system. Then it submits its request to the, to the resource manager. And the resource manager and node manager make sure that this jar file gets copied to the local file system of the machine that hosts that container. Now the node manager can start the application master, which can now load it from its local file system. So this interaction is slightly more complex than you would think at first. Um, and if we really list all the things that the Yarn client has to do just to start the application master. It's these eight steps. I could go through each of these steps, and I actually have roughly a page of code for each of these steps. Um, I'm not going to show you all of this, because I mean, I'm going to show it, but I'm not going to talk to it. Um, there's some uh, interesting things here that you see that in, in this code, I have to set up the class path for, um, for that container. Um, I also have to set up a command. This is a shell command that runs uh, that runs a JVM, and I'm actually I'm in charge of making sure that um, standard out and standard error are captured somewhere properly. And uh, if I if, if I build this command in the wrong way, then nothing is going to work, and uh, I'm going to get a very uh, unexpected behavior. So uh, it's quite complex, 
And uh, there's a lot of things you can do wrong. And um, if, we, if we look at all this, this was only the first step, right? This was only submitting the application master. The same kind of code is required again in the application master when it wants to start containers for the individual tasks. Right? So we have a duplication of this code. It happens once in the application master and once in the ARN client. And uh, so, so we end up writing quite a lot of boilerplate code. Um, so Yarn is great. Nothing against that, right? But it is quite complex. In order to write an application, you need to learn three different protocols. And each of them is complicated especially the protocol between the application master and the resource manager. It's, it's an asynchronous protocol, and lots of uh, interesting race conditions can happen there. Um, what you get is really full power. You get full control over all the different knobs that you can twist and turn in Hadoop. But it's actually at the expense of simplicity. It's, the, the learning curve is very, very steep. And, uh, I don't know, how many here have actually written a Yarn application once? OK, how many of you? Oh, wow. I know Steve has written many of them. How about you? Did you like it? <laughs> yeah, so I, I had a lot of fun when I first did this. And uh, my first little um, application was over 1,000 lines of code. And it really didn't do anything. All it did was it was logging a single line. Um, <laughs> so, um, so at Continuity, when we built uh, our product, we found ourselves re-implementing that boilerplate code over and over again for all the different things we were doing in Yarn. And we very quickly realized that there, there must be a better way. It must be, there must be an easier way to do this, because there are common patterns that we find again and again. And um, so we, we looked at a class of Yarn applications, or distributed applications, and we found a similarity to multi-threaded applications. Many distributed applications consist of processes that run on different nodes in the system, but they don't actually need to talk to each other. A lot of times, each one runs autonomously, like a Java, like a Java thread. Right? And if I would program this, in Java, as a multi-threaded application, I would have utilities in Java from, from the concurrent package. I'd have executors and things that manage my threads for me. Um, so could we do something similar for Yarn? And, and the answer is yes. The answer is, is Apache Twill. So uh, this started as an, as an internal project uh, inside of Continuity, and uh, we started talking to some people about it, and there was there was a very high interest because everybody who had written Yarn applications uh, saw the need for this, uh, this simplification. And um, the programming model we have is indeed just like Java threads. You define runnables, and then you run them in the cluster instead of running them in, in, in thread pools. Um, it was incubated about half a year ago. We have uh, had two releases since then. The third one is in the making, and the community is growing. So let me show you a small example. So this is uh, an application that will run a single container or a single runnable in a cluster. And all that it's going to do is it's, it's going to log a message, hello world. Um, so in order to define the application, all I need to do is, is define this runnable. That's all I need to do. And then I need to start the application. For that, I create a yarn Twill runner service, which connects to the Yarn resource manager. And it can then start the application for me. It's that simple. Um, a similar application using raw Yarn APIs would be, Steve, how many lines of code? Hundreds, 500, I don't know. Um, so, um, so this is the simplicity and the power of Twill. Um, it's easy. Now, what's the architecture here? Um, the idea is that in your application, you define Twill runnables. And that's the only interface that you need to define your application. And it's very similar to Java threads. 
And then there's a Twill runner service. The, anything that's green here is part of the Twill framework. Once you submit your jobs to the Twill runner, the Twill runner will start a generic application master, which knows how to negotiate with the resource manager. And then all of the tasks that you've defined, all the runnables, they will run in containers and they'll be wrapped into a Twill, we call them Twill task runners or Twill, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, and so you really don't need to worry about how they are started. Right? All that boilerplate code is in the green areas in this diagram. And the only protocol that you need to learn now is this API between the Twill runner and your Twill client. And it's, and it's fairly easy. OK, so um, the first example we had had only a single runnable. Uh, what if I need an application that has more than one type of task? Say I have a producer and a consumer. Um, well, I can do that, of course, in Twill. So um, I can use a slightly more, more verbose builder pattern to define my application. And now, in this example, it's a crawler and an indexer. And so I define these two runnables, add them to my application, build it, and then I can submit it, just like I could um, submit that simple Hello World app before. Um, so a lot of the complexity is, is taken away. And that in itself is, is very helpful, I think. But in addition to that, and, and, and Steve mentioned that in his talk, there are certain common patterns that many distributed applications implement. And in addition to the simplicity that Twill provides, it, it also provides some of these patterns out of the box. And you can just reuse that in your application. So one of those is logging. Um, we, we saw in this example that typically a, a Hadoop application logs to uh, some files. And those files, um, they're on the local file system of the nodes in the Hadoop cluster. Right? And when the job is done, the, uh, the resource manager or the node manager will copy them to HDFS and then they're available for you and so on. But if you write, say, a real-time event, uh, a stream processing engine, that's never going to end. It just keeps running, and your, your job will never terminate, and so your logs will never be available in a central place. And uh, plus, if it's a real-time application, you would like to have insights about the behavior of your application in real time. Right? You want your logs in real time. And um, that's not that easy to do, but uh, fortunately, there's a great technology called Kafka. So uh, what we did in Twill is when you start a Twill application, the application master will actually run an embedded instance of Kafka. And uh, all the tasks, all the runnables you have, when they emit logs, we inject a, a specific log appender that sends these log messages to Kafka. And now from your tool client, you can retrieve those log messages in real time. Um, very nice. And um, the good thing here again is, you don't need to know how Kafka works. All you need to know is, how does, what's the Twill API to do this? Right? And really, the only thing you have to do is you have to add a log handler. And the log handler API is, is just a very simple callback API on error, on warning, on debug. And there, you can just reuse an existing uh, handler that we have, or you can just write your own. Um, another feature. Uh, we call it the, the resource report. When you start an application in the cluster, it's going to run somewhere there, but you don't really know anything about it. You know, maybe you know it has 10 nodes, maybe you don't. Um, what Twill does is it, it gives you this information as a re resource report. You can talk to it using REST, and um, it'll tell you about uh, the current state of the application. How much memory is it using? How many virtual cores is it using? Um, how many instances are there? How many instances are actually live and are still sending heartbeats? Um, what are the hosts where it's running? And so on. Um, this is then registered, this REST endpoint is registered as the tracking URL in Yarn. So when you go to the Yarn uh, UI, you can just click through and you get that information. 
But uh, there's also a way to get that information programmatically uh, from your client. And uh, we will see later how that can be very useful. OK, so now Twill allows me to run an application. Let's say my application runs for 10 hours. So in the meantime, I call it a day. I go home, close my laptop. I lose the connection. So now at home, I open my laptop again, and uh, I'm not connected anymore, right? So what can I do? Um, I want to I want to connect back to that application, right? And uh, of course, that's a that's a pattern that everybody wants, and uh, Twill implements that using Zookeeper. So again, this application master here, it records the state, especially where it's running, in Zookeeper. And when you start a new Twill client, it can use that information in Zookeeper to reconnect to a running application and can then get a resource report or do other things, lifecycle management. And the APIs, again, are very simple. Um, command messages. Um, another very common pattern. I'm running, say I'm running 10 Lucene indexers. And at some point, I want to take a snapshot. I want them all to, uh, to flush at the same time. Um, in Twill, you can do that by sending commands to every runnable. And um, again, this happens through Zookeeper. Um, a Twill client, again, just uses an API of the Twill runner. But um, that will then, this arrow goes in the wrong direction, by the way. Uh, that, that will then um, put that message into Zookeeper. All the tasks, because they are wrapped into a Twill, um, kind of a Twill wrapper, are actually listening uh, and watching those Zookeeper nodes. And when a command appears there, they all have a callback. And, and then that command gets executed. So um, in the runnable, um, I just have to implement a method to handle a command. And the command is just a simple, simple string, basically. Um, OK, elastic st scaling. Uh, how often do I run an application and I realize it doesn't have enough capacity? I want to add five nodes. Or maybe I'm using too much capacity. I want to remove four. Um, with Twill, you can change that with a single call. So if I started with 10 instances, or I started with five instances, um, I have a simple API using the controller to change the instances to 10. Internally, this is also implemented as a command message. But you don't need to know that. Next interesting topic is service discovery. Steve already talked about that. If you uh, say you run a web service in, in your cluster, but because it runs in Yarn, you don't know where it's running. You know it's in, in one of these 100 nodes, I have 10 instances of my Tomcat. But you don't know exactly where to connect to. So you need a way to discover that. And in Twill, you can do that. And again, uh, using Zookeeper, every task can register itself. And that adds this information to Zookeeper. What's the host where it's running? And what's the port that it's, uh, that it's listening on? And then uh, through the Twill client, I can find out that information. Right? And um, again, very simple APIs. In the Twill, Twill runnable, I have an initialize method, and that gets a Twill context. That context gives me access to Zookeeper, and there, for example, I can announce my service. And then on the client side, I can just uh, use the controller to discover that service. Simplicity. OK. Uh, one problem that we often have is um, I have an existing jar existing Java code, and it has dependencies on some version of a library that happens to conflict with a newer version or an older version of that same library that Hadoop uses. And now I'm, I'm screwed. I can't do anything uh, unless I find a way to avoid loading the Hadoop one. And um, one way of doing that is to, building a, to, to build a bundle jar that contains all the dependencies of the application. And then, uh, so for example, here I could have a, um, a main class, maybe a record class. And then I need an explicit version of Guava, 16.01. Guava is, uh, is one of the biggest pain points because they broke backward compatibility in a recent version. 
And um, now this will be inside of my jar, and I can submit that to, um, to Twill. Uh, there's standard ways of building bundle jars. It's actually an OSGI pattern. And um, I can then execute that uh, in Twill. Uh, we have done this um, to, uh, to run Presto inside of Yarn. Uh, Presto is a SQL engine that was built at Facebook. It's similar to Hive or Impala. And uh, we just wanted to know whether it's possible to run something like this in, uh, in Twill. And it would have been straightforward if not for the version conflicts. So this feature was explicitly added for running existing applications over which we don't have control. We can't change their uh, dependency versions. OK, last but not least, distributed debugging. Have you ever run a distributed application and it crashes? And you don't know why? Never. And <laughs> All right, now you add lots of logging to the application, and it doesn't crash anymore. <laughs> race, condition, race condition is gone, who knows. So um, wouldn't it be nice if I could just go into my um, IDE and say, connect the debugger to this application, to this runnable of, of that type? And um, that's what we did with Twill. So when you have an application, you can start it with debugging enabled. And when you do that, you actually say, these are the runnables for which I want to um, enable debugging. What Twill does is it starts the JVM um, with the option to have the debugging port open. Right? There's a standard Java protocol to do that. By default, Java won't do that. And uh, so what you have to do is you have to find the free port on the machine, and then start the JVM with that option. It's kind of tricky to do that, because the JVM that is open for debugging does not know about its own port. Uh, Java is kind of weird in that way, right? So um, if you want to implement that yourself, uh, it's going to take you a couple days to, get, to make it work. Um, so in Twill, this is, all this little hacking has been done. And, um, we already saw earlier, um, there's a way to get a resource report, which uh, informs you about where do all my runnables run, how many are there, and so on, right? So through this same report, um, resource report, you can also find out about the debugging part of each of the containers, right? And then you just attach your IDE to it, and you can debug. Um, one note here is um, Twill is as secure as the Hadoop cluster that you run in. So if you have Kerberos enabled, Twill is totally fine with that. The moment you do this, you lose security because um, Java has no way, no way to secure that debugging port. So uh, don't do it in production. Don't do it when you don't know that the environment is safe. OK. there's. Quite a few more features, but I want to come to an end. There's also quite a few features that we still have to build. So right now, Twill has a nice API that you can use, but you have to program against it in Java. Um, just for usability, uh, we just want to build lots and lots of command line tools. For example, finding out the debugging port of that runnable that you started. Right now, you have to write a little Java program and then print it. Um, would be nice to have a little command line tool. So um, yeah, as a reminder, it's an open source project. If you want to contribute, these are really nice little things that you can start with. Um, then there's uh, some nice distributed application patterns, I want to say like uh, distributed coordination. Let's say you want to do leader election. Let's say um, you want to do some synchronization barrier. Um, this, these are things that many applications need, and uh, it's our goal to add those things to Twill. Um, there's actually the, the curator, the Apache curator, that implements some of these recipes. Um, we might include that through curator. We, might, we, we don't know yet how to get it in. Um, uh, anyway, that's on the roadmap. We want to be able to run non-Java applications. Lots of data scientists love to write Python code. We can't do that right now with Twill, but uh, we will soon. Uh, we want to enhance the way that you can do 
lifecycle management of your application. Right now, you can start it, you can send commands to it, and you can stop it. But, uh, and you can wait for it. But it would be nice if you could pause it and then resume it. Um, it would be nice if you could, could collect metrics in the same way that you can collect log messages. Now, that would give you much better insights into the performance characteristics of the application. Where are the hotspots? Do I have a distribution skew or not? You need metrics for that. Um, and here's one killer feature that, that's uh, currently being built, um, is a local runner service. Uh, suppose you could run any distributed application on your laptop in memory, in threads, and then you could just debug, you could just develop and, and test on your laptop, and you never need to deal with a cluster until you really go um, and want to try it at large scale. Because um, if you look at the APIs that Twill has, there's not a single Yarn or Hadoop dependency in it. All the APIs are independent of Yarn. Then there's implementations of those APIs, and one of them is the Yarn implementation. But uh, we're currently working on a multi-threaded uh, implementation, and uh, that would be really nice. Uh, yeah, and lots and lots of other things to come. Suggestions are welcome. Summary. Yarn is powerful. It allows you to run arbitrary applications in a Hadoop cluster. But Yarn is complex. Kind of difficult to learn protocols, a lot of boilerplate code, steep learning curve. Twill makes Yarn easy. The programming model is similar to Java threads, and everybody knows how to do that. Um, so what you get as a sum of all these is you get a productivity boost. You get all the power of Yarn with the simplicity of Java threads. You're going to develop distributed applications in two hours, three hours, instead of two months. Last thing to mention, uh, Twill is open source. It's uh, in the Apache incubator. Any open source project can only live if its community lives. So we need contributors, we need committers. We need people who want to volunteer to do the hard work. I volunteered. Who else is volunteering? Steve is. Oh yeah, you are. You've, you've been volunteered. <laughs> so uh, it's lots of fun to work on these things. Um, so go to the website, go to the mailing list, Maybe you find something interesting. And with that, I think we have about five minutes for questions. Thank you. Hey, um, you talked about metrics. I assume you, you meant um, the yarn metrics, right? Like Met metrics? Metrics, yes. Um, what about application metrics? Like that, that's what I was talking oh, that's about. What, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So Yarn yeah, gives you some yeah. metrics, but they're yes. not very useful because Yarn doesn't know what your application is doing. Exactly. Right. Um, that's one thing. Um, right now, that it, this is probably not implemented yet. Um, what's your recommendation to do that? Just have have the application just talk to some graphite server or something, or what, what do you? So, so there's implementation and there's APIs, right? So if you look at um, how we do logging, there's simply a, a, a simple way to emit logs, right? Um, so um, I would think, uh, it's, it's not even here. So uh, it's, it's simply a, an SLF4J log appender that we use for logging, right? Uh, for metrics, I would think uh, there, there is a, a, an open source metrics library. I think it's just called metrics. Um, it's the old dapper. Uh, a dapper thing, and th th those APIs are actually powerful enough. And uh, what I see is that Twill will have an implementation of those APIs that, in the background, maybe uses Kafka, maybe uses something else to uh, to collect those metrics. That sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Um, in in Steve's talk, he mentioned the the Spring XD. I'm uh, just wondering how easy it would be to oh. put port a Spring app into Twill, or whether oh, you need to look at something else? That's, that's a good question. I haven't, uh, I, I, I can't give you any on, on that. I, I, I feel that Spring is uh, 
definitely more mature and, and more powerful at this time. Also much more complex. Uh, programming in XML. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> more questions? Did you see anyone? I don't... Oh, there's someone. <laughs> he waited for you yeah. to come all the way to the front yeah. to make you walk. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm not a Yarn expert, but as far as I understood, that MapReduce implementation then that runs on top of um, the, uh, Yarn is uh, also a Yarn client, right? Uh, so there is a Yarn client for MapReduce. Is, uh, is it there, correct? Yes, there there is a um, an application master, the MapReduce application master, and there is uh, uh, the Hadoop client that allows mm -hmm. you to submit MapReduce mm -hmm. jobs. So that comes built in with Hadoop. So do you know uh, whether it will make sense to port it to Twill and how much efforts it will be and uh, do you have enough features in Twill right now to fully implement it? I would say in theory it's possible, but MapReduce is such an elaborate framework and so much work has gone into how MapReduce actually drives execution. There's lots of subtleties uh, about in what I mean, how soon can you start reducers, their speculative execution, all these things. It's certainly possible in Twill, but I wouldn't say it's natural. I, uh. Anyone else? If not, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.